Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jesse Nickerson. I'm an actuary at Guy Carpenter. Uh, if you were here yesterday, we're going to be working with the same spreadsheet. If anyone's got a computer and wasn't here yesterday, we've got some thumb drives. I think there's some in the back uh, to follow along. So <clears throat> yesterday we looked at uh, the, what we had as the tabular tab. And so quick overview for people who weren't here. It seemed to be a lot of, a lot of hands who are first timers. Uh, we've got 20 simulated loss outcomes. They've each got probabilities uh, assigned to them, totaling one. We simulated losses for two lines of business. We summed them to get the portfolio result and then sorted them by portfolio results so we can calculate easily uh, exceedance probability by just summing probabilities of losses that are at least that big. Uh, and then we had this kind of mysterious valued in uh, distortion function G. And this was what we just saw a, a little bit ago. This was the linear uh, piecewise linear G function. So this was interpolation linearly between 10 pricing points from, from cap on data. So today we're going to get onto the parametric worksheet and we're going to, rather than using that piecewise linear distortion function, we're going to go through the same exercises using this linear yield function. Uh, the, and those exercises, if you weren't here yesterday, we looked at kind of two things. We looked at um, valuing reinsurance from this perspective and we looked at uh, kind of your handed plan loss ratios. How do you assess um, appropriateness of premium being charged via that plan uh, through the lens of your, your kind of risk preferences inherent in that distortion function? So on the parametric worksheet, we've got, um, a, you can see, I can do some quick back and forth. Everything's the same, same loss, same loss scenarios. Uh, same setup with everything except our column I and J as a result have changed. We're using a different distortion function. The distortion function that we've got now, the formula at least in shape will look familiar to you. Um, I guess we've got it in two stages so it may not be as familiar. Here's uh, column H is the, the linear yield function, right? So this is the occupancy charge which is up in I2 plus the exceedance probability times the consumption charge, which is in I3. So in the worksheet, we've got a spot for risk-free rate, which we've set to zero, so we're kind of avoiding it, but it's worked into the workbook so that you can kind of play around with that on your own time if you're interested. Um, right now, these are valued in, in I2 and I3. So these would correspond to the curve that you saw. This is the... Um, least squares fit to that pricing data that we pulled from catastrophe bonds. So this is saying, if you're going to decide on the linear yield dis distortion measure, you are going to uh, best fit to the data where you have it available, and then just extrapolate outside of that, ending at that point one, one, these are the parameters that you get for the curve. So uh, one more thing, and then if you weren't here yesterday, this is kind of the, the kicker is in column J, these are first differences, so this would correspond in this discrete setting to the G prime of S dx. So this, these are the transformed probabilities. So this is kind of the, the reweighted probabilities, what we're integrating with respect to or summing with respect to to get the distortion uh, risk measure, the spectral risk measure. So that said, um, let's head right to the assessment. Let's see if I can do this in an easy to view way. All right, so yesterday, maybe I'm not gonna look. All right, so yesterday we looked at shareholder value created by um, the plan, right? So we were looking at plan loss ratios were handed to us, 85% for line of business one, 65 for line of business two, and we said, through our distortion function, we have a view of what appropriate premium should be charged. And this is expected loss plus the profit based on those risk preferences kind of ingrained in that function G. And if we looked at those premiums compared to what the plan was suggesting as premiums, and we look at the difference, we can actually calculate what kind of value we're creating for the shareholder. So here we saw line of business one, creating value, that's great, good plan numbers. Line of business two, not so great, drags the whole company kind of into the negative and we're saying, you know, through the, the distortion function that we've selected here or fit here, we're not super pleased with that plan. 
with the linear yield function, we get a different perspective. So in this case, actually both lines of business, line of business one we were all right with through, through the previous G, here now we fit to the same set of data, right? We've calibrated these things to this, those same 10 points and we're coming up with a, a vastly different conclusion. We're saying, well, these things are not priced appropriately. There's not enough premium to support this risk through the lens of this distortion function. So it kind of drives home the point that there's some, there's a lot of uh, judgment involved here, right? You're selecting a distortion function. You're not only parameterizing a distortion function, you're actually selecting the flavor of the distortion function. You're using a piecewise linear, um, or you're using this linear yield, and you get two different, two different views. So why is that happening? So before we get into the reinsurance stuff, we'll head up here and take a quick look as to why that's happening. So remember, when we were using the piecewise linear, John talked about um, you know, the, that last straight shot up to the point one one. This is a constant slope that has a constant derivative, the G primes are constant, and as a result, the, the reweighted probabilities are constant, right? And you can see it jumped, uh, you know, this is exactly half of that because the original probability was exactly half of that. But the, the reweighting, the kind of distortion that's going on here, and a huge spectrum of the distribution, right? That's a long line to get back up to that point one one. Everything is being treated the same there. Uh, we had a constant ROE in that region. In the parametric case, using the linear yield function, we can see ROE, it's calculated for us in column H, and we can see, you know, we're, we're actually above it for the entire span, right? The constant ROE we were just looking at in John's picture was 31%. Here in this span, uh, where we kind of don't have any data, the, the lowest ROE that we're actually charging is 30, 37%, we're going all the way up to 239%. So we're, we're more risk averse in that region. We've taken the line and we've kind of bumped it out with some curvature to it to get it off of that diagonal, which is, which is the risk neutral um, line. So let's take a look at the reinsurance and we're, we're probably thinking like, oh, this has got to have changed as well. Take a quick look. Probably just gave away that it didn't. <laughs> so we take a look. Uh, yesterday we had these three layers that we were looking to price. We pretended like we got rate on lines uh, quoted from the market. Then we looked at 500 excess of 15, 500 excess of 2,000, and then that full stack of 1,000 excess 15. And, and we calculated the same type of shareholder value. We said we can calculate what we would require as premium, how we would price this risk, and compare it to what the market's saying and decide whether it's adding value to the firm. So in this case, we said uh, options one and options three, so this is the lower layer and the full stack, were adding value. That upper layer, we didn't agree with the, the way the market was pricing the risk. Um, we think the risk is less risky than the, than the market is requiring, and we would say, well, we're not interested in that, so which one adds the most value to the firm? We'd go with option one. In the linear yield view, we get a pretty similar set of conclusions, right? We're saying still option one and option three, the same structures are adding value to the firm. Uh, the top layer is still, you know, we're in disagreement with the market pricing as to how risky that is. And we would again lean towards option one, and that would be our, our choice of reinsurance structure. So why did that not change? Anybody have a stab at that? Pricing involved in the higher layer, or the further out in the tail of the loss distribution, that's where you have your net pricing points. Perfect. Yeah, like th think about the, the fits that John showed you, right? Inside where we had those 10 data points, everything was pretty good. Everything tended to, to kind of fit those data points well. That's what's creating the, the G and the G prime and our, how we're distorting these probabilities. So if we, thank you for answering that question, by the way, sometimes it's tough when you ask something and nobody says a word. <laughs> um, so if, if we look at the probabilities here, the reweighted probabilities at the bottom, you know, 3.9, 3.5, 4.5, and we get into the parametric view, we're kind of in the same ballpark here, right? Not exact same numbers, but same general shape of distortion going on in that region because everything fit pretty well to the data points, right? And the line of business assessment was relying on the other end of the spectrum of loss outcomes, right? We have this huge piece of the distribution that we're not, uh, that we have a different view on now. So 
it's tough. I mean, extrapolation outside of the data points, there's not much to go on, which is what leads us to, to this reliance on ROE, or the view through the ROE spectacles. And we're going to take a, a second stab with this function. So now, pretend like we don't have any data, and we're going to take a, a different view on parametrizing it. So if you've gotten a workbook handed to you to kind of trace through formulas and you eventually stumble upon what looks like a blank cell and there's white on white in it and you got mad at whoever created the workbook, well, we did that here. So K1 through K3 has some values in it. Just for your reference, K2 and K3 are the best fit values. So we're going to get rid of them here, but you'll have them stashed for future use. Uh, K1 has a formula to sort of back into the minimum rate online using the uh, relationship John projected for you. So we're going to pretend, rather than using pricing data points, you might have already said to yourself, these lines of business, you know, what if I'm not even doing property? What, where does cap bond pricing come into play? How's that relevant to me? Um, here's a different take. So now we're going to pretend like senior management has handed us these views that we're going to calibrate to. And somebody has handed you a view of minimum rate online. That's how we're going to tune the occupancy charge. So if you copy and paste the value from K1, into I2, it will magically make the minimum rate online 2%. So a manager said, I've got, a, or a finance person said, I've, I've got a perspective on this. Uh, my, my professional instincts tell me the minimum rate online should be somewhere around 2%. Well, now we're left with this consumption charge and we need to try to tune that to something else. And we're gonna use an overall cost of capital to do that. So if you scroll down, rows 53 to 57, uh, we've got them set up for, for kind of some financial inputs. So for this example, we're going to say uh, book value of the firm is 1700 And we're going to say, you talk to a, the CFO, and the CFO said, I don't care about distorted probabilities, but I can tell you that you need a 15% ROE. I know that. So we're going to enter that into cell C54. That implies something nice for us. We can say, well, you gave me the ROE. I know what the book value is from the accountants and I can just multiply them and say that is what my implied required profit is. So I have to price this stuff or I have to take a view of pricing that is in alignment with this type of, of overall profit level. Um, the implied required premium, since we're doing everything net of expenses, we're going to say well, I just backed into how much profit I need and I know what my losses are. Right? So I can add these together. I right, sum cell C55 and scroll up to the undistorted expected losses in cell E30. So just expected loss plus what you just kind of implied to me I need for uh, profit, that gives me my required premium. So right now, I can check to see whether I'm in alignment with what I was given or not by comparing these two cells, right? I calculated my required premium using those inputs of occupancy and consumption charges, and I can um, compare that implied required premium to the required premium I calculated. Not in alignment, right? So we're going to tap into uh, solver functionality to get these things to agree. So in that solver difference cell, I'm just going to take a difference in whatever order because we're going to optimize it to zero and say, well, we disagree by about 120 right now. And just to save the button clicking, and I thought we'd be pressed for time, um, you can tap on solve for RK. And I put in a warning just in case I wasn't paying attention to my own rules. Make sure the cursor's in C57, and then hit the button, and it'll optimize RK. So it was around, it was like 237 before. Uh, it has now solved, backed in, it's maintained the minimum rate online at 2%, and it's backed into the consumptive risk charge that is in alignment with that overall return on equity uh, hurdle rate provided to us by the CFO. Now we could revisit the same stuff, and we could look at line of business results, and if you recall where we were at before, we said using this linear yield model, now none of these lines of business look like they're uh, achieving the required premium for the risk through that lens. Well, we've recalibrated this G. We have not changed the flavor of the G function. It's still linear yield, but we've chosen new parameters with kind of different underpinnings of, of logic, and it gives us a different view, right? Now, each one of these lines of business is generating value, and why is that? Well, we've calibrated down to a much lower uh, consumptive charge, right? So through this lens, we're saying this stuff is less risky and, and your pricing for the plan looks good. How are you doing on All right. 
you could do the same thing for the reinsurance. And uh, uh, so there's yeah. a couple buttons, you could do that and uh, get a different comparison there. So uh, with that, I'll pass it over. Stay up there. Can you add a column to the right of J for me? Add a column or widen that one. And do the, and do the ratio in that column of J divided by B. But widen them so they can see what the number is. Yep. And then copy that one down. That's, to me, this is how you want to look at this exhibit. Because the problem with column J is it's key to different probabilities in B. But now we've divided out. That's a true, if you want to get a sense, that's the height of the boxes for those that remember who were here yesterday. That's the distortion, simplest way to look at it. That's the G prime. Apologies, G prime, whatever. That, but that's the that's the effect on the probability. Am I right? Column J is the implied probability. But that normalizes for the fact because because Jesse was calling. If you go down to like 20, when you move from 20 up to 16, it goes from 1% to 2. So it was hard to see in there because the the the, pro, the values in column J were all of a sudden key to a 2% probability, not one. But this way, now you see it go down. If everybody can see that, 4.2, 2.1, 2.1, 2.05, 1.98, da, 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 da. That's, now you're really seeing, I see the linear effect. All right, any okay. questions? One quick one, I, mean, I know we're over. No harm, no foul. Um, okay, so if I've understood it correctly, which is a very large if, um, uh, we, we're using the um, cap bond pricing market to calibrate a distortion function and we felt reasonably confident that we had data in the extreme end of the tail, so that probability is more remote than, say, 10%. Could we, um, so, so that's already a little counterintuitive to me, because when I'm pricing, I'm pretty confident in my loss distribution up to the 80 to 90 percent off, and then things go crazy beyond then, and I don't know if I've specified correctly in things. Um, could we use the market pricing just above the 90th percentile and then use a more traditional approach below the 90th, say, just expected loss divided by a loss rate, a target loss ratio or something. Like, so a lot of calibrators. The, one of the presentations was about how do we extrapolate the pricing that for the parts of the distortion function that we do have data to the rest of the distribution for the more likely probabilities, but that's not what worries me. It's trying to price the tail is the problem. And we, have, we seem to have data for that. So, so there's a whole spectrum of, of things you can do. Um, one approach you can take is to say, to some degree, this is a sort of thought experiment, right? We're not necessarily <laughs> suggesting that in, in insurance is actually priced like this, but what we're saying is it could be priced like this. And if it was, what are the implications? So one of the things you can do is you can say, all right, we're, we're going to price a, you know, an unlimited ground up quota share, so we're going to do the, the full range across all the options, given a distortion function, what's the implied loss ratio? Is that reasonable? Right? That also gives you a way of kind of filling in the rest of the curve, and you, you can look at that over a range of things. So you've sort of got the points at the end, you, you, you probably want to hit those, they're a constraint, but then you also know, you know, I see lots of data points in the market for that, I see the people, you, you have to sort of adjust for expenses, but say people are running a you know a 95% to pure loss ratio, so it's a loss to loss premium, you can calibrate to that as well. So that's another approach that you can take. Alright, we're here after the break, we'll let everybody go. We know we're way over time. Thank you. Thank you.